to our our translation just for those of you that haven't been in Sunday school uh, the Latin Vulgate translates this word with the word piety and piety used to mean kindness which is an accurate representation of the Hebrew word that's translated godly in our in our Old Testament but it's actually the Hebrew word is a word for kindness and so piety being kindness in the Latin was an accurate translation but piety has changed meaning in the last 300 years and piety has cha has been changed to mean godliness if you look at a Latin dictionary from 300 years ago versus uh, a re more recent one you'll see that there's an actual change in meaning but our translations haven't kept up with that change of meaning they take the modern uh, Latin not the the ancient Latin so the, the King James was tra translated in the ancient Latin uh, using a word that reflected accurately the original language but our modern translations use the modern tr translation of piety which is not an accurate translation of our Hebrew or Greek they use it for both the Hebrew and the Greek so in, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament this word that is normally translated godly or godliness in your translation refers to something that is good devotion to God and I've, I've generally been referring to it as something that is good because well, the word you means good, but it's good because God declares it to be good. In other words, it's something, it's a devotion to God that God admires. God speaks well of it. He uh, recognizes it as something that uh, he requires, and he identifies it by his own value system as a devotion or an honor shown him that is good. And that's in contrast to Asabase, which is the word sebamai, devotion for God, with the alpha privative in front, which means not devoted to God, or uh, perhaps uh, in some contexts, a devotion for God that God does not speak well. It's something that somebody might uh, think that they're demonstrating for de devotion to Him, but He does not recognize it as good devotion, so it's ungodly. In 1 Timothy, there's another word that is being used that I looked at briefly, mentioned it this morning, and we looked at it about three or four weeks ago in Sunday school, a word that's translated profane. It's used in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, and we'll start there this morning. And the reason we're looking at this is because of a comment Tim made to me about three weeks ago, and I'll mention that in just a moment, but in 1 Timothy 1, 9, uh, we read this in Sunday school, but we're going to look a little bit more in depth this morning. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the righteous, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, or for the ace of ace, the one who is not demonstrating genuine honor or devotion to God, sinners for the unholy, and profane for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, uh, fornicators, homosexuals, uh, slavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to healthy doctrine. It says the law is made for profane individuals. And then he lists a long list of illustrations of that which is profane. And if you're here for Sunday school, you know that the, the word profane is also a combination of two Greek words. One word which refers to a threshold, crossing, actually crossing a threshold, and another word which indicates trampling something underfoot. And it's a trampling under something underfoot in a negative way, usually used in reference to that which um, God does not desire to be trampled underfoot. So in other words, it's the idea of God has something set out here that is uh, he would speak well of. He would recognize as something that would demonstrate a uh, way of honoring him or demonstrating devotion for him. And he sets it out there. And somebody looks at that, and rather than uh, using that in a manner that God would desire to demonstrate honor for him, it's crossing the line of what is honorable and trampling it underfoot by, dem by viewing it as something as, as common, something that is not valuable, and basically trampling it underfoot. And he uses this term profane in relationship to uh, law keepers and a multitude of manifestations of works of the flesh not limited to works of the flesh. It, in, it includes um, uh, yielding to satanic attack. It in, involves getting caught up in elements in the world system and allowing world system values to influence our opinion of what um, God would value and tainting that. Uh, but anyway, we have this word here, profane. And one of the things that Tim uh, noticed uh, 
was that this word profane occurs at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book. In other words, 1 Timothy is a sandwich. Now, he didn't use this term, but it's a sandwich if you look at it in relationship to this word. Profane ends, begins the, the book, and it also ends the book. The very first, last verse in 1 Timothy uh, uses this word in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Ends with this word. 1 Timothy 6, verse 21, well, verse 20. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge for prof professing it. Uh, excuse me, it's in verse 20. I said 21. Uh, my, my translation doesn't translate it profane, but it says, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid uh, irreverent babble and, and prof profane babble is what they say. Avoid profane babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be to you. So the, 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 the letter starts with identifying something or that which is profane as being uh, synonymous with some aspect of law keeping and uh, elements of demonstrating works of the flesh. And then it book ends with this word uh, with a warning against that which is profane. And so we have... Uh, Actually, it's also used in the very middle of the book. In chapter, I think it's 4, verse 7, it's used in the middle. So the word profane occurs three times in the book. The beginning, and then the middle, and the end. And it's used in relationship to this idea of being, uh, of, well, actually it's used in a contrast, in a sense, of that which is contrasting, that which is genuine devotion for God, which God speaks well of. In fact, that word... Um, use of ace, good devotion, devotion that God admires, devotion that God speaks well of, uh, honor, uh, demonstrating honor for God that he recognizes as being good in his estimation. That word occurs eight times in 1 Timothy. So it carries four times just in chapter 6 alone, but eight times in, in 1 Timothy, and that's the word it's translated godliness in most of our translations. We have the word it's translated godly, which is just the word sebamai, occurring one time. And then there's another word that's translated godliness, which is theo sebamai, which is actually more accurate, would be more accurate to translate that godliness, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a devotion strictly to God. Uh, it occurs one time. So ten times this idea that is translated godliness occurs in 1 Timothy. And it occurs throughout the entire book. And so if you look at this, the, the, one of the themes, one of the, the main emphasis that, for, that Paul has written Timothy in this, in this book involves this idea that our, translates, our translators translate godliness, that something that is honoring to God in a way that God I, uh, recognizes as honoring to him, and it's in direct contrast to that which is profane, that which should be honoring to God, perhaps, but is trampled underfoot, or that which should be trampled underfoot, but is held up as something that we, we want to honor God with. Either way, the, and we have the works of the flesh are things that should be trampled underfoot. They're things that we, shouldn't, we should not be lifting up works of the flesh as, as a means of honoring God should be trampling and I don't think many of us would do that but the other hand uh, people take their their legalistic works their law works and hold those up all the time to God and say that this is honoring God look look at God how many times do I go to church versus how many times a week do you go to church how many times do I pray during the week versus how many times do you pray for, during the week do you uh, do you give thanks before you every single meal like like I do, or like somebody else does. I, we have the, these these legalistic ideas that we think would would honor God, that are rules and regulations that we set, and we hold those up to God, for for uh, what I well what I've been calling attaboys from God. We 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 want God to to speak well of us. We want Him to say well done, and so we have these ideas of of what would would. Um, elicit that response from God. Well, if you look through the book of 1 Timothy, six chapters, 
there's a number of words that are used that develop these two ideas. And I think this is probably where our Sunday school class is going to end up going over time here as we move away from <clears throat> strictly this, this looking at what God says about this use of base, this word that uh, has been translated godly, and look at more in depth at 1 Timothy because 1 Timothy seems to be uh, pretty much a manual, a class on how to how to honor God, how to demonstrate genuine devotion for God. It starts out with, with um, in the very first or second verse, it says, uh, to, verse 2 says, To Timothy, my true child in the faith. So we know the book primarily, first and foremost, is written to Timothy because it says it's written to Timothy. But when we get later on, in, in the book here, in chapter 6, the end of the, the book, in verse 11, he makes a statement that is, is kind of interesting. When he says, but as for you, O man of God. Now, who's he talking to here? Well, I would suggest he's probably still talking to Timothy here. But he changes the address. This is evocative in the Greek, which is the, the mood of address. The, it's the mood of address. I mean, it's, it's uh, like we would say, Jeremy, get my, get my keys to my car, please. Um, Tim, get, do this, do that, do, do the other. It, it's, it's, a, it's a firm address. It's the same sort of thing. I, didn't, I don't have it here, I don't think, in front of me. But I think it's in Galatians chapter 3, where uh, the book of Galatians was written to a group of people called the Galatians. And we have a vocative case in Galatians, I think it's chapter 3, verse 1, when Paul, who is addressing the Galatians, says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He uses evocative there. He's addressing the same group of people. He hasn't changed the group, so he, he, when he's talking to the Galatians, when he uses evocative, he says, O oh, Galatians. Well, here he's talking to Timothy, my child in the faith, but in chapter 6, when he, he uses this form of, of, uh, of address, and he says, O oh, man of God, not my child in the faith, but O oh, man of God. And he doesn't say, O oh, Timothy, like he does, oh, foolish Galatians, he says, oh, man of God. So he goes from child in the faith to man of God. And I suspect that one of the, there's a couple of reasons he does that. Number one, uh, I suspect that, that, that I mean, God is encouraging Timothy not to allow anyone to despise his youth because he is a young guy and he wants people to recognize that Paul, Paul views Timothy as a mature believer. He, he identifies him, even though he's Paul's child in the faith, Paul was the one who gave him the gospel and was responsible for, for uh, leading him to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And so there is a, a father-son relationship there. Paul also recognizes him in spite of his few number of years, he recognizes him as, as a man of God. And he wants those people that are reading this letter to view Timothy the same way. And so Paul is giving him a degree of respect that he wants the people that are, are going to, he's going to be pastoring. He wants them to, to give Timothy that same respect. And he wants Timothy to be aware that you have been given this title as an encouragement to live up to that title. And then going beyond that, I believe that this also is an encouragement that's while this letter is primarily addressed to Trent, Timothy it's not limited to Timothy in scope because we have in here what we probably would call the theme of the book if you go to chapter 3 of first Timothy chapter 3 verse um, verse no, verse 14 says I hope to come to you soon but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pilgrim, a pilgrim, a pillar and buttress of the truth. And so we have right here in the middle of the letter, very center of the letter, this theme that the entire letter wraps around. And he's writing this to Timothy because he is going to be one who's going to be taking on a pastoral role. He needs to know how the household of God operates. But information in this book is given to the household, so the household knows how to operate. <laughs> and there's, unfortunately, I think a lot of people uh, might tend to look at this as being 
um, an address to how one should operate when they're at church. <laughs> I actually went to a church, and the reason I'm, I'm not saying that because of an abstract thought, I actually went to a church for years that a number of men, the, the pastor did not teach this and did not believe this, but there's a lot of individuals in that church who had a very legalistic view. They had that view when the pastor got there. He didn't give it to them. They had it there all by themselves before he got there, and they held on to that no matter what he taught. And that was a view they had. And you could tell by, just by the way they handled this and by the way they handled other scriptures. Uh, this is how you, you operated a church. And so if you look at, at was it chapter 2, chapter 2, or chapter 3, chapter 3, I think, the, the instruction upon widows, you're supposed, you're supposed to give to widows when, when they come to church on Sunday. If they don't come to church on Sunday, then their weekly stipend, that gets you put in your own pocket. Because after all, losers weepers, right? I mean, I'm just using that as a as a foolish illustration but this is talking about how believers should be relating to each other as believers <clears throat> and there's a number of terms that are used throughout this book that develop this idea of being profane versus being or demonstrating genuine devotion or honor for God we have as I've already mentioned the word profane itself and it's used in contrast with law in the first couple of uh, first few verses verse 9 of chapter 1 we also have this uh, term godly is a, uh, that's translated godly it occurs uh, 10 times but then we have another word that only occurs in first timothy it occurs two times and it, it doesn't occur anywhere else in scripture and it's really kind of a unique word if you go to chapter 2 verse 3 Well, I have to pick up the context to know what he's saying. But in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, uh, prayer, intercession, thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Which, by the way, uh, is not saying you just pray for rulers and authority on Sunday. This should be a part of your regular prayer life. Uh, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. Here we have our word godly. Um, my interlinear translates it piety, but a but it's our word eusebeia. It's a word for a life that is demonstrating good, uh, in, by God's estimation, honor honor to Him or, or um, devotion to Him, peaceful quiet life, uh, honoring Him, dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing. In the sight of God our Savior. Now there's our translators may translate this a couple of different ways. We have one word which is good, and there's a couple of different words for good, but this is the word that is is intrinsically good. You have a word that is good that is good because it's beneficial. Um, the word that, that's not this word. Agathos is is what I call it's my spinach word in the New Testament. It's good for you. So you should eat it because it's good for you. I don't like the taste of spinach necessarily. I like raw spinach and salad, but cooked spinach I'm not as crazy about. Uh, growing up, I hated it. As we talk about taste change, I actually kind of like it now, but I, but I really hated it growing up. But it was good for you, so eat your spinach. It's, this word is, is not that word. This word is word that's intrinsically good, so it's, it's, some, it's got a beauty to it because it's just good through and through. It's something that everybody would recognize as good. Or in this case, it would be something that God recognizes as good. So it's something that he defines as beautiful. He, it's, good, it's beautiful because he, he views it as, as good. He says, the, this, having this attitude of communicating with God on a regular basis about these individuals in different manners for these different individuals, God says he, he sees that as, as an attractive quality in a believer. But he says, it is pleasing in the sight of God. My, my translation has pleasing. I know some of your translators have something else. But this word pleasing is a word that is uh, apodektos, I believe is what it is. Did I get that right? Like I said, I don't have my notes in front of me. But it's um, a word that is, again, a combination of a couple of Greek words. Apo, which is a preposition, out from, and dektos, which is something that's, that's, that's pleasing. And so what this is actually saying is, this is something that's pleasing, but not just because God gets tickled pink over it. It's pleasing to him because of where it came from, the source of this activity. Because of, it came out from a source 
that the activity and the sort, in other words, the motivation behind it or this or the empowerment behind it, either one, something that that caused this activity and the acti and the resulting activity, God says is well pleasing to Him. Uh, one trans or one one dictionary identifies as gladly welcomes it. It's the idea of, hey, haven't seen you for a while. I'm really glad to see you. Missed you. This is the illustration I had. Oh, this. Well, that's okay. She, 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 Holland doesn't have to be here for it. I'll give it to to Jeremy. I want you to know, in spite of the lack of sleep I've had the last couple of days and the amount of time that I had this put in on this, I took time away from that and spent a long time on something for a gift for Jeremy and Holland. And I thought about it long and hard. And so, Jeremy, would you come down here and receive this? He doesn't know what this is. I told him I was going to give him something, but he doesn't know what it is. I want you to know that you, you're a parent. You've got several boys. You've raised them. I know it's hard work. And I want you to know that I think that you're a great dad and mom. And so I, made, I spent a lot of time on this picture so that you can put it up in your home as a testimony <laughs> that I see you as, as good dad and mom. Okay, so thank you. Jeremy, shake my hand. <laughs> now, I know for a fact that many of us have pictures like that on our refrigerator in our home that are very valued possessions because our children maybe made or grandchildren made something or maybe just a, somebody, a, somebody that of, of a certain maturity range did that, that we just appreciate because at their maturity level it's what they could do to demonstrate an appreciation. And so we hang that up on our refrigerator and, and maybe we'll take it down eventually once they grow up to the point where they're embarrassed to have it up there or maybe we keep it up there to embarrass them, regardless. But the point is, my giving, that I suspect that that's not going to end up on the refrigerator. If they do, it's to, to just as a joke. <laughs> because the source of that is different. If that came from their own two-year-old, that would be appreciated in a different way than coming from me. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not so much the gift itself, although it may include the gift, but it's also, this word includes the source of the gift, it's where it came out from. It's pleasing to God because of what it is and where it came from, came out from. And so as we're looking to this word, it only occurs twice in this book, and it only occurs in this book. So, and God uses it twice. He uses it here, and in chapter 5, I think, in verse... Um, Chapter 5, verse, uh, verse 3, verse 4. But go back to verse 3. It says, Honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show, here's our word, godliness, genuine honor to God, to their own household, and make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. So here we have the word that is used of honoring God in a way that he describes as being good, coupled with this word that describes something that is well-pleasing to God because where it came from. So this shows that Paul is giving Timothy some instruction as to what it is that God desires. What he finds pleasing, what he views as valuable, honoring, that's what the word honor means, is something that demonstrates some kind of a, a value. And when you, you put someone in a position of honor, it's because you, you think of them highly, you value them for whatever reason, their, their opinion, their, their person, a spouse, child, whatever, you, you value that person. <clears throat> if it's a, a thing, maybe you value it because it was, uh, Grandpa Joe's, and, and it may not have any intrinsic value, but it's valuable to you, to, to you personally for some, uh, for some reason, the uh, emotions attached to it. This is <clears throat> something that is well-pleasing to God because of what it is and where it came from. And so as we look through the book of 1 Timothy, <clears throat> we can see that 
<clears throat> there's a number of words that are, that are interwoven with each other that build upon this concept of being honoring to God because it demonstrates something that he finds appealing, something he finds beautiful, something he views as valuable. By his definition, we're going to see that that as we uh, this is basically just kind of an overview of some things we're going to be going through in Sunday school. But as we see this word pleasing, the reason that these things are pleasing to God is because it's in harmony with the very first statement I think that He makes here. Um, oh, I've got it here. Verse, yeah, back in chapter one at First Timothy, verse five, He says, "The aim of our charge." is love that issues from a pure heart. This is going to be again revisited in different ways throughout the letter to 1 Timothy. Sometimes the word keeping the commandment unspotted. What commandment is he talking about? Well we only have one commandment and it's this commandment to love. <laughs> And so when, when Timothy is exhorted to keep the commandment unspotted, the very beginning of the letter begins with an exhortation to devoting oneself to uh, a proper ministration of love. And love specifically, as he says in chapter 3, verse 15, how oneself ought to handle himself within the household of God. So our activities with each other, our praying for each other, should be motivated by love. Our Ministration as a path, we have the qualifications for a pastor laid out here in chapter three, and the qualifications for deacon laid out in chapter three. What's the motivation for them to serve? Well, it's there may be many different motivations, but there should be one the motivation, the ministration of love, keeping that commandment, keeping it unspotted. Unspotted meaning free from our own uh, personal uh, things that we throw into it so that we can get something out of it ourselves. Uh, it, it's strictly uh, serving strictly unhindered out of love. What's the source of that love? Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, long-suffering, kindness, faith. The source of this, God finds it well-pleasing because it comes out from a particular source, and that source has its origin in the person of God himself. The things that God finds pleasing is activity that finds its source out from God. It comes out from God through the believer. And that activity, twice in this letter, God actually says, this is well pleasing to me. Now, I think that this is my opinion, okay, because I don't have a direct statement, but I can show many illustrations of, uh, well, for instance, uh, we have uh, somebody taught years ago um, what the will of God is, and the will of God is, uh, can be identified, it was either 11 or 12, so 12 things that are specific statements in scriptures that this is the will of God concerning you. So the mystery, of, the, the, excuse me, the understanding God's will shouldn't be a great mystery because there's 12 direct statements that, say, this, that says this is God's will concerning you. Well, for years I went with that and I was pretty happy that I knew God's will until I finally came to a realize, realization that that's only a primer. <laughs> that's, that's kindergarten for what the will of God's concerning you is. As I grew a little bit, I realized that God had to tell me what his will was so that I could kind of get my, my head wrapped around the fact that it is clear. I don't have, to, there's not this great big secret. He makes it very clear. But as I understand this, then it starts becoming clear other statements when God says, well, love one another out of a pure heart. Gee, he doesn't say this is God's will concerning you. He says, do it. That means it's his will concerning you. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of things that God, well, a lot of things that are, or actual statements, God says, do this. A lot of times a Greek imperative is used, which means it's necessary for you to do this. There's no mystery as to whether it's God's will because he tells you to do it. If He wouldn't tell you to do it if he didn't want you to do it. But he tells us here, there are two things that he says clearly are well-pleasing to him because of the source. Are these those the only two things that are well-pleasing to him because of the source they come from? I would say absolutely not. I would say that's kindergarten. Timothy, or Paul is giving Timothy a, I don't know if I want to say the word primer or at least a beginning textbook 
on how to demonstrate devotion for God. But he uses another term in here uh, that is, and again, I don't have my notes here, so I probably don't have it right in front of me, but it's, I think it's in chapter 4. Is it chapter 4, verse 7, where he says to train yourself? Yeah, uh, verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and good doctrine you have followed. <coughs> And then he says, verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for this genuine demonstration of devotion for God or a genuine demonstration of honoring God. Training yourself means it's something that doesn't come naturally. It takes effort. You have to work at it. So Paul is giving Timothy the basics here on how to lead a life it, how to function around other other believers in a manner that is well pleasing to God, be, but it's it's just the beginning. And he says to Timothy, "You need to train yourself in this." That means it goes beyond what I'm just saying here. These are the basics. And he uses a number of words that are interwoven together that indicate how these basics are put together in a manner in which demonstrates a life that is honoring God a life that demonstrates devotion for God based on his definition, based on what he desires to receive, a life that is in keeping with demonstration of love out of a pure heart. And so the one word is we looked at is a contrast to this, that which is profane. We see this idea of honoring God occurring 10 times in the book. We have this word well-pleasing because of where it comes from occurs twice. We have the word faith occurs 18 times in the book of which one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times at least. There's an eighth time that I'm not positive about yet, but at least seven times it's used with the definite article which re is a reference to faith specifically as it relates to a living aspects of the Christian life, not just faith in general. Several times it's used to faith in general and it's used both ways in the book. And then we have another word, truth, which occurs five times in the book and three times it's coupled with a definite article which refers to the truth, a specific truth that has specific reference to certain things within the Christian life. And so these words are interwoven and they all have a relationship with each other throughout the context of 1 Timothy. <clears throat> Honoring God, devoting oneself to God, being well pleasing to God, demonstrating a life that is in harmony with, with love that is unstained. Faith, the faith, truth, the truth, all these terms relate with each other into one general concept as to first and foremost how one should behave oneself within the household of God not just at church but within the household in your life at that you live with other believers and how our life relates to our relationship with God whether it's well pleasing to God or whether it tramples underfoot the things that he describes as being valuable and beautiful to him and holds up things to him that come from a different source. Things that come from our opinions, our background, our flesh, our soul, things that make us feel good, things that we, one of the things that, that I introduced this uh, here, short series on a while back was some, I'm sharing this because I don't think all of you heard this, was a, a woman that I, I knew years ago in church who uh, had a, a husband, his birth, he had a birthday coming up, and she had a red carpet, a red rug that she, kind of an oriental type rug. She really wanted it. It was a little bit pricey, and she really wanted this. So for his birthday, she bought that red rug that she wanted for herself for him. That's the sort of thing that we do for God. We have a, a love for God that is not pure. We have a love for each other that is not pure. It's stained by the sin nature. It doesn't come from God as to its source because the Holy Spirit doesn't allow love to be contaminated by our sin nature. The love we show oftentimes uh, is stained 
by our sin nature. And that is not well-pleasing to God. We offer up things to God that we think logically in our mind because our opinions of what he ought to want, what we, he, well, after all, don't you think God would want this? Well, God hasn't said he wanted it, so no, I don't. How could you think that God wouldn't want you to be in church every single Sunday and that he, would speak well, he wouldn't speak well of you unless you're there every single week? He says to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. <laughs> By golly, if that's not God's will, I don't know what is. But that's under the law, and the Sabbath is not Sunday. And I mean, we, we could go on, but I'm just saying we have illustrations of things we hold up that we think ought to. Logically, God should expect, and we expect an attaboy from God. We expect an attaboy from you because, by golly, you ought to see that I'm doing these things, so you ought to pat me on the back and say, good boy, Jim, you're doing real good. And God ought to pat me on the other shoulder and say, good boy, Jim, you're out doing it real good. And we oftentimes can find ourselves in that realm of being profane, trampling underfoot the very things God says he wants, not tr because we haven't trained ourselves. The things that God desires, the things that will allow us to grow and mature and really demonstrate a life that's well-pleasing for him does not come naturally. It takes work. And Paul knows that because he put the work in. And he's encouraging Timothy to put the work in because he knows it's going to take Timothy some work because it's not going to come naturally for Timothy. It's a, it's a proven fact that <clears throat> pastors and <clears throat> teachers and missionaries people that are involved in full-time Christian service, whatever it is, they are not genetically engineered Christians. In other words, God, when God the Father gave his DNA to believers, when he says that his seed remains in us, that seed is not genetically engineered into something special for certain Christians to where they, they have just a, a better ability to do things than others. And, and the reason I'm saying that, you might think that's funny. I would have never used that that description but growing up I believed that and I think most people believe that when I would be <clears throat> uh, faced with the opportunity to doing things for church so to speak growing up you know as a, as a kid going to church <clears throat> there'd be a work day something a way to serve another believer come to mind whatever it is a way of serving in some capacity <clears throat> And well, oh, that, that that yeah, that'd be nice. I see that'd be nice, but but um, but I'm, I'm busy. I'm I'm real busy. I got I I just I'm real busy. <laughs> you know, I I'm, there's I know there's other people that that's just what they want to do. That's what that's what. Well, the reason a pastor is a pastor to church is because that's just what he enjoys doing. I have. I want to be a violinist because I really enjoy playing the violin. Pastors want to be a pastor because they enjoy pastoring. People want to be a, a, a missionary in, in Borneo and, and because that's what they, they enjoy doing. You know, we all have different things in life that we like to do, and I'm just not called that. But yeah, I go to church and I give my dollar in the offering plate, and I say that because that's what my father always gave growing up. Going to, every time the offering plate came by, he put his dollar in. And I remember the very first moment in life that I learned about Christian giving was I was sitting in church one day and my dad wasn't there. And I had my own job, at the, I think I was 16. <clears throat> and as the plate was going around, something, I believe the Holy Spirit that put this in my head, I was looking at the number of people at church. It was probably about the number we had. It was a small church like this. And as a, we passed the plate there. I'm glad we don't here, but we did there. And as the plate was going around, I looked and there's, you know, there's 23, 15, 18, 20 people. If everybody put that dollar in that I'm putting in right now, I know for a fact the pastor's full-time wage comes from the offering that's coming in that plate. And you multiply that by four, this guy would be sur surviving on about, if he's lucky, 80 bucks a week. That, I couldn't see how that factored in. I, I couldn't see, that didn't compute. I gave 10 bucks that day. And as soon as the plate went by, Oh, I wish you could. I want to back. Well, that was tough. I want it back again. I was 16 years old. That, 10 bucks in 1970 something. That was a lot, a lot of money for me, making two bucks an hour. But it trained me. God impressed upon my mind something about Christian giving that I needed training in because I hadn't been taught correctly. Learning how to demonstrate a life that God finds pleasing takes training. And sometimes it causes us to step out of our comfort zone. But 
God gives us everything we need to understand it. He gives us individuals that have uh, reached that level that are demonstrating honor for God through, through lives of our, of our pastor and hopefully other individuals that are an illustration for us of how to demonstrate a life that is honoring for God. But it still takes training to do that. And I think we'll probably spend in Sunday school some time going through First Timothy, seeing how these different words uh, interact with each other, relate with each other, to demonstrate a very clear picture of how God sets up a premise, a, a training program, so to speak, for beginning living a life that is, is valuable, honoring to him, a life that he says is well-pleasing to him. Father, we do thank you that, again, you are a God who desires the very best from us, but you, you desire far more than we could ever give on our own, but you give us the, very, uh, the enablement to give far and above what we can naturally give. Uh, you give us supernatural ability. Not that we can run the mile in two minutes, but we can do things far greater than that. We can meet the needs of individuals. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can demonstrate your kind of love, which has been foreign to the mind of man ever since mankind set foot on the earth. And that's far greater thing than, than ever, anything we could ever hope or imagine on our own. So we just trust that we might be motivated to pursue that which is uh, described by you as well-pleasing to you. Uh, by what is defined as well-pleasing to you, using your, your criteria, using your, your standard, and using the means uh, that you provide us with to accomplish your will for your glory. Amen.